Well, now that Windows 11 is officially out, I've decided to switch over to Apple. It's only been about 40 years since the 8-bit era. To some people, that may not seem like a long time, but the release of the Apple II is actually closer to the end of World War II than it is to today. Today, many people may think of 8-bit as a sort of buzzword. Things like pixel art and retro gaming being so popular, not many people may realize that things looked and acted that way simply due to the hardware limitations of that time. Now, any modern off-the-shelf machine is capable of running software that people couldn't even dream of writing a few decades ago. Operating systems are running dozens of programs at a time and calling hundreds of more commands in the background. But the progress of technology isn't anything new for people. There were periods of human history we call the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and even now the Computer Age because those technologies have so deeply revolutionized human society. And during those eras, there were more inventions that affected human history than we could mention. Writing spinning, gunpowder, marbles, plastic, and of course, movable type. Many give credit to Gutenberg for the invention of movable type, but the real story of how it was created takes us to ancient China. Invented by Bi Sheng during the Song Dynasty, individual character blocks were first created from a ceramic or wooden material, and the characters themselves would have to be written in reverse. These individual blocks of type would then be arranged in a frame, brushed with ink, and pressed onto a piece of paper. This process was laborious, seeing as each character block needed to be meticulously handcrafted, but revolutionized recording and distributing information. No longer did every individual document have to be written by hand. Instead, once a document was arranged in the frame, it could be printed as many times as needed. For many centuries, this was the peak of writing, not just in China, but all around the world. It wouldn't be until 700 years later, with the invention of the typewriter in 1868, that writing would see another revolution. The typewriter, in one way, is like a personal printing press. While you may not be able to reprint the same document, typing is nonetheless cleaner, faster, and easier than writing is. Typewriters worked great with 26 letters, but not so great for Chinese, with its total character count being over 100,000. How could you possibly build a typing machine with that many characters? Well, in actuality, of all the Chinese characters, only a few thousand are needed to cover most of what needs to be written on a daily basis and there were actually a few versions of a Chinese character typewriter that had several thousand characters. Some of the most notable being the Hou Quin Chou Tong Zhe typewriter, which used a wheel that the user would turn to the right character to print. IBM's Chinese typewriter, which gave each Chinese character a four-digit code that would have to be punched in, or the Double Pigeon typewriter, which had all the characters on the bottom tray, and the user would navigate to the correct one and print it on the page. The history behind these machines certainly is deserving of a video by itself, and I'll link to a video by June Ferno which goes into some detail with each of these. With the introduction of the personal computer in the late 70s and early 80s, there arose a mixture of computers and typewriters, known as the word processor. What was again so easy for those with a Latin-based alphabet to implement became a difficult issue for those in the East. Their solution was not so simple. With computers using the typical typewriter keyboard for input, how could one ever type in Chinese? The answer actually came in 1958, when the first National People's Congress had approved an official romanization system for Chinese, referred to as pinyin. This system gave each Chinese character a standardized way to spell its pronunciation using the Latin alphabet. Now let's jump forward from the 50s to the China of the 1980s. Deng Xiaoping was leading the People's Republic of China, Chen Shu Hua is on the radio, and the kids are in the street eating an ice pop. Personal computing is just beginning to be a word whispered in the ear of a few. But all those systems were English-based. No system was available for the layman. That was until the creation of the electric Chinese word processor. Take a look at the stone Chinese English word processor, which was sold in China in the mid-1980s. Zooming in, we can see how Stone adapted this computer to be an ideal Chinese writing machine. The keyboard reveals that, while it still retains the basic QWERTY setup, each letter and number is also tied to a different pinyin consonant or ending, letting the user type much faster. The red character on each key are also shortcut characters, 
the most commonly used words in Chinese, which you could type directly by holding the key with red text that says frequently used characters on the bottom left, followed by the letter key. Aside from word processors, what about mainstream personal computers? Well, it wouldn't be until 1985 when Taiwan-based E10 developed an IBM PC compatible operating system capable of taking Chinese input. By that time, those in the US and other countries had been enjoying personal computing for nearly a decade. But did it have to be that way? Would it have been possible to take a run-of-the-mill 8-bit computer and produce something that could at least be the equivalent of a Chinese word processor? Well, now that my main machine was one such computer, an Apple IIe, originally released in 1983, I decided I'd try to push the machine as far as it could go and see if I could create such a program. The only real question was, how exactly do I create a Chinese word processor for a 40-year-old machine? Just like the typewriters we talked about before, I knew it wasn't practical or necessary to include every Chinese character, but I wanted it to have a decent number of characters. After taking into consideration my machine and the forms of data storage available for it, a 140 kilobyte 5.5 inch floppy disk, I determined I could probably comfortably have 3,500 characters available for use in my program. Again, it wouldn't cover everything, but if that was good enough for IBM, then it was good enough for me. Let's go over quickly what kind of machine I will be working with. I'm using an Apple IIe, again originally released in 1983. It has a 6502 processor running at 1.02 megahertz, along with 64 kilobytes of RAM. Yes, that's only 64 kilobytes in total to work with. And with these restrictions in mind, I opened my own favorite word processor and got to planning. The first design decision was an easy one. What language do I write the program in? Basic or assembly? Probably obvious to anyone who actually worked with these machines before, I had to go with assembly. Nothing against BASIC, I just need my program to be as fast as possible. However, since I had never programmed anything in assembly before, I began by searching the archives across the internet for some form of guide. I eventually began to collect PDFs and bookmark sites, which served as my starting place. As a note to anyone else interested in learning about assembly programming for the Apple II, a lot of these books said something like, you should already have a good background with 6502 assembly before you read this book and I still have yet to find a book that says this is baby's first assembly tutorial. Anyways, after reading several guides, I realized I needed the right software to write and run my assembly code. Enter EDASM, Apple's assembly development system. The only issue being the school which I had bought my Apple II and discs from didn't have a copy of EDASM. So instead of buying one of those five and a half inch disc to USB ports to copy the .disc file I found online, I use some really cool software called C2T that lets the user copy data from a device that plays a sound into the Apple II's cassette port and onto an actual disc. And thus, EDASM was on my own computer. But I also decided to write the actual program using the Apple Wind emulator and transfer it over the same way later so that I could get good footage of the process. So with my discs in hand, my many guides open, and my spirits full of hope, I plunged into the dark abyss that is 6502 assembly programming. I had a rough outline for how I wanted my word processor to work, as you can see from this Photoshop mock-up. But I had to learn the tricks of the trade of assembly programming first. Essentially, I broke it up into three sections. One, get user input from the keyboard. Two, draw on the screen. And three, read data from a disk. Getting user input was easy enough. The Apple II has pre-existing monitor subroutines, which I can call to get whatever key is typed. However, interestingly, Apple II ASCII is a bit different than standard ASCII and follows the chart shown here. There are sections for inverse, flashing, and normal characters, but to be honest, this isn't something I need to worry about. I just have to make sure that whatever data I read or write needs to have the same encoding as these normal characters in this section. Drawing to the screen, however, is where things get a bit complicated, and by bit, I mean a byte. The Apple II graphics mode isn't like modern screens where 0, 0 is at the top left corner. The 280 by 192 resolution is controlled by 7,680 bytes that control 7 pixels each. Yes, that's right, 7 pixels each. It breaks down this way. The first 7 bits in the byte control which pixels are on or off, and the high bit controls which color palette is used. Now, this visually may look confusing with the crossing lines, but remember that we write numbers with the highest value on the left. So it does actually make sense that the first bit in the byte controls pixel 1, 
the 2 controls Pixel 2, and so on. I'm also not going to talk about color pairs or the different palettes right now, that's a story for another day. Now the lines on the screen aren't laid out in memory sequentially either, that would be too obvious. No, instead from where the screen's memory begins, bytes 0 through 39 are line 1, followed by bytes 40 through 79 here on line 64, 80 through 119 here on line 128, only to go all the way back up here for bytes 128 through 167 to be on line 8. What, did we skip a few bytes? Yes we did. Why are we on line 8 now? I don't know. If you are confused, don't worry, I literally never closed the website explaining how it all worked. To determine which byte you go to based on your x, y coordinate, please use the following formula. Got it? Good. The best part about screen memory was that once I wrote my assembly code for this formula, I never had to worry about it again. Moving on from that mess, let's talk about actually drawing to the screen. Given that each byte controls 7 pixels, I decided to use a 12 by 12 Chinese font. That way there would leave some space between the characters, as opposed to what using a 14 by 14 font would do. So here's an example of what I do to draw the word God. I stick it onto a 14 by 12 grid and then analyze each pixel to see which are turned on, changing all those values with a pixel drawn into a 1. All I have to do then is set the correct memory location to this value, just like this. But oh, there's those color cells being a pain. I'll switch over to a monochrome monitor for the rest of the time, and there we go. Now only one more trick to learn and I'm ready to start actually programming. <sighs> Disk I.O. It took me a solid week of hopelessly staring at assembly to figure this one out. If you've seen any recent questions on Apple II Disk I.O. on Stack Overflow or RetroComputing.Stack Exchange, that was me. And thanks to those great people who answered all my questions. But still, Disk I.O. was rough. At several points I even thought about completely giving up, or at least just trying to load as many characters as I could directly into memory. But there's a reason no one has tried that yet. Because using all available memory, and even using the switchable ROM banks, I would only be able to fit in about a thousand characters, well below what I wanted. Eventually, after reading many more books, I realized that I would have to switch from my DOS version of EDASM to a ProDOS version, because if I used a disk formatted for ProDOS, it would be much easier to read smaller amounts of data. I could read in 512 bytes at a time, a section called a block. One of these ProDOS assembly manuals had an example program in the back showing you how to read in a block of data, and typing in that program line by line from that book certainly made me feel like all those people who grew up in the 80s talking about how they would type in these programs from the back of the computer magazine they bought at the store. And eventually, with this professional help, I finally could read in my data file, and I was ready to start the real program now. This was the point where I realized how inconvenient my machine actually is. To edit my code, I turn on the machine, wait for EDASM to boot, make sure I'm reading the right disk, load my code, and then I can get to work. To test my code, I have to save it, wait a day and a half for it to assemble, get out of EDASM, and then run my machine code file. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there with no sympathy for me right now, considering this was just how programs were made back in the day. And I honestly feel bad for those programmers who had to sit through this assembling song and dance day in and day out. I don't want to go on too much about this, but by the time I had hundreds of line of machine code to assemble, sometimes it would take so long that I would forget what I actually wanted to test by the time I got to running the program. In the background, I've been playing a real-time video of how long it took to assemble my program once I got further along in the project. But anyways, other than how slow it was, I did feel really cool once I got familiar with the assembly commands and started writing dozens of lines at a time. But now, let's talk more about the final product itself and how it will work, starting with the data file. The data disk is broken into three sections, starting with section 1, the ASCII section, including all uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and punctuation. Each is given their 1 byte ASCII value from the Apple chart, then the 12 bytes of their screen data. Where did I get the screen data? I started by using a font called Feng Zheng Xiang Su and then with a Python script, quickly read each pixel of each character and determined the value of the 12 lines per letter, just like I showed earlier. Section 2 of the data is the pinyin of each of the 35 characters. Interestingly, there were only 394 unique pinyin, 
and these were all followed in the file with a block number that the character's screen data would be located in, the inner block offset, and the number of characters with that pinyin, which would be located in that block. For example, any word with the pinyin tian is located in block 12, has an inner offset of 96, and has a length of 8 characters that match that pinyin. This makes it easy to load in the correct portion of section 3, the largest section of the disk, which is the raw 24 bytes of data for each character, one after the other. This section right here is why I can't store it all into the computer's physical memory. It's over 90 kilobytes. And while that might not seem like much, remember the whole system I'm working with is only 64 kilobytes in total. And if you at home try to create your own data disk, make sure that you have some way to check that your data is actually correct. Otherwise, you may wind up like me, wondering why the left half is printing correctly while the right half is not, desperately trying to find some bug in your program, only to realize five hours later that the issue was with your data itself. So how will the actual program work? I start by loading in section 1 and 2 of the data disk into memory. That way, typing any ASCII character and loading up the block number for each Chinese character will be fast. Then, if the user types a regular ASCII letter, the program searches through the data until it finds the corresponding letter, marks the 12 bytes of screen data, calculates the screen position based on where the cursor is, and then plots all 12 bytes. If the user switches to pinion input mode, the program searches through the pinion section to find if there is a match. If one is found, then the block section is loaded. Actually, three blocks are loaded every time, since 24 bytes adds up a lot when multiplied by 40 or more. It then uses the offset to determine where the 24 bytes of the proper character start and displays them as options on the bottom line of the screen. The user can then use their arrow key to see more characters if they are available. When they make their selection of the up to 9 on the bottom line, they may press the 1 through 9 keys to write it in place of the pinion they just typed. Even this is just a brief description of the program, and there are many more things I'm checking for and calculating under the hood, but this isn't a step-by-step -step tutorial. Rather, this is more showing off a prototype. My first designs for this program were more extensive and included things like file saving, page scrolling, multiple opinion input, things that would actually turn it into a decent word processor. What I've written here is literally bare bones Chinese input. It doesn't include any industry standard tricks that make typing Chinese actually convenient, like character prediction or word association. But at this point, I feel like I accomplished what I set out to do. I wanted to show that it was possible to make a Chinese word processor on an early 8-bit personal computer. Sure, I could expand the program and write a thousand or ten thousand more lines, making it the best word processor on the Apple II. But I also have to ask myself, who would use it? I mostly created this program to show what could be done. Going back to when the Apple II first came out, it could have been a big commercial success in China from the beginning, if the right people were there to make the right software for it. And actually, Apple II clones eventually were big in China. Look at this Chinese textbook I found, teaching kids how to use the Apple II. And here's some real software I found before I even began to learn assembly for this project, back when it was just an idea. From Shanghai Jiaotong University, Chinese Word Star. A decent Chinese word processor for the Apple II, although it was written in 1989, during the twilight of the machine's commercial lifetime. And my own work goes to show that Yes, programs like this are not only possible to write, but one guy on his own with a few modern tools could write one in a few short weeks. So now, let's copy it onto a physical disk and run it on my real Apple II. This project has taught me many things, one of which is that I don't consider capital typing to be yelling anymore. It also has instilled in me an appreciation for the power and speed of modern computers. Even our modern programming languages are like magic compared to what people had to deal with just a few years ago. I could easily have written a program like this in an afternoon using a modern programming language for a modern platform. But again, that's not the point. The point is this. 